shot, but I got the reach. Hop lock, now I'm off the leash. Mic drop, I ain't gotta preach. I just do what comes natural. Five star, everything I see. Live lives, no apology. Take charge, no one can compete. I just do what comes natural. Hey everyone, welcome to Printful Threads Volume 4. I'm Hannah and I'm part of Printful's marketing team. I'll be your host for the afternoon. Printful Threads is Printful's very own online conference series. Each conference is dedicated to a different topic, like digital marketing or how to start your own business. If you've, but let's take one step back. What's Printful? You could say we're a print-on-demand company, and you wouldn't be wrong. But above all, we're a company that helps people turn their ideas and passions into brands and products. So if you've got an idea for a brand, we'll take care of your orders while you do the fun stuff, like creating designs, building a community, and making sales. If you've joined previous editions of Threads, welcome back. And if it's your first time here with us, we hope you'll become a regular. Make sure to stay tuned on social media for future conferences, and you can also check out our YouTube channel for previous ones. When you hear the word organic, the first thing that comes to mind might be fruits or vegetables. But today we're going to be talking about organic marketing, which you can think of as providing the nutrients that your business needs to grow. Instead of spending a ton of money on paid advertising or sponsored posts, organic marketing is all about getting people to naturally discover your brand. And just like with fruits and veggies, there are tons of tactics to choose from when it comes to organic marketing. From tantalizing TikToks to blog posts brimming with juicy keywords, there's practically a supermarket full of organic marketing strategies. During today's conference, we'll cover just a handful of them with the help of four e-commerce experts. Lucas, Martinc, Sandy, and Nico. They have a wide range of experience from building communities on TikTok and Instagram to helping companies use data to reach their ideal audiences. Maybe you've checked out the agenda ahead of time, but let's do a quick recap about how this two-hour conference will look. After I finish up my intro, we'll be joined by the first three speakers, Lucas, Martinc, and Sandy, who will each present for 20 minutes. Then we'll take a quick 10 minute break for you to refresh your beverages and for us to look at some of your feedback from social media. After that, Nico will give his 20 minute presentation and we'll wrap everything up with a good old Q&A. Before we jump into it, I wanna let you guys know how you can communicate with us, leave your comments or questions for our speakers. One way you can chat with us is in the comment section of wherever you're watching this live stream. Our team will gather your questions and we'll bring them up later in the Q&A round. When you type your question, make sure to mention the speaker who you'd like to ask so that we know who to give it to. If you're watching on our Printful Threads landing page and you want to leave a comment, just open up the video on YouTube. Another thing you can do while you're watching is to post your takeaways on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or a public Facebook page using the hashtag Printful Threads. We'll be sure to bring up your findings later on on the screen in the conference. As a thank you for actively sharing your insights using the hashtag Printful Threads, we'll be randomly selecting three lucky winners to win $30 coupons. To be eligible to win, all you have to do is post on a public social media account using the hashtag Printful Threads. We'll reach out to the winners privately within 24 hours after the conference has ended. And if any of you want to check out Printful.com and order some cool custom goodies for yourself, you're in luck. As a little treat at the end of the conference, we'll be sharing a coupon code you can enter at checkout to get $5 off your order. The coupon code expires at the end of August 9th, so don't wait too long to use it. I'll try to make this transition as organic as possible. So without further ado, let's get into our first presentation about the importance of building and engaging your brand's community 
with Lucas Alouette. Lucas is the head of marketing and product at Speech, a software company that analyzes online community engagement to improve user experience. He also teaches at Barcelona-based business school ESEI, so he's more than ready to put on his instructor hat and share his insights with you. Welcome, Lucas. How's it going? Hi, Anna. Thank you for the intro. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for introducing me very quickly. Uh, so today we're going to look into understanding the importance of the brand community. Um, but before even that, I think uh, I owe you a little presentation of myself. Um, so about me, I'm French. I'm based in Barcelona, Spain. I'm 27 years old. Uh, and it's been a little bit over eight years that I'm working in community engagement and community behavior. Uh, I've worked for brands uh, between thousands of employees and team of one, uh, principally in e-commerce and higher education. Um, and today I'll be talking to you then about um, the brand community. Today I'm also the product and marketing uh, head at Speech. And Speech, uh, to explain you quickly uh, what it is, it's a consumer marketing solution. Um, you have the presentation kind of on screen. Uh, to put it very simple, it's kind of the traditional loyalty programs you all know, uh, except that instead of rewarding your community for their purchase, you reward them um, for everything they do for your brand. So it can be pictures on Instagram, engagement on Facebook, purchase, obviously, and, and a wide range of actions. Um, so this is what we do at Speech, uh, and that's what I do today. I'm also uh, basically the link between our clients and our product team. Uh, so I make sure that the market needs are adapted into our product. So before we start uh, talking about the importance of community, something that um, I've found is very important to understand first is what is a community and what is a brand community? Um, a community, as you may know, is basically a group of people that have the same interest or kind of something in particular that they all share. Uh, in our case, for example, um, the common interest would be your brand. So your brand community uh, is basically people that have an interest in your brand. Um, one of the mistakes I've found in several companies, all sizes, uh, when talking to clients, when talking to different profiles, uh, is that the common mistake is that when you think brand community and when you're trying to market yourself, you think your brand community is the people that are buying your products, your service. Um, they're part of it. They are very important to your business because they are the one that make you uh, that makes your business work, basically. Uh, but there is also a wide range of people uh, that you might not think of. And unfortunately, if you don't think of them, you don't communicate to them uh, and you're missing out on very big opportunity here. Um, for smaller team uh, and small e-commerce is actually the brand community can also be uh, your personal community, because if you're a team of one, uh, your business will be link to your personal life too very often um, so your community will be your existing customers your family your friends your followers uh, but also the people that visit your website that you may not know of the subscribers you have on your newsletter uh, again um, your your followers on instagram on facebook the people that you might not see every day the people that you might not identify but the people that actually see your messages that are interested into your product are interested in what you're talking about and that's when it becomes a little tricky. Um, when marketing your business, you often think about audiences because that's the way most of the platforms are made. It can be Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. And we tend to focus into sharing our message to the people we want to share it to. Um, so you are like, okay, I'm sending my product. I would like to sell it to this type of clients. Instead of thinking who is interested in what I'm selling. Your community is actually the people that are interesting in the message you're sharing and the product you're selling. Um, I often use the example of a classroom and the common mistake is that, for example, the community uh, you would think would be the entire student room. So all the students sitting uh, at the table while the teacher is speaking. Actually, the community is only the student that are listening to the teachers with, as you all know, uh, can be very different and, and the number might vary a little bit. And again, you might think, OK, that's cool. Uh, all those people are part of my community. I might know them. I might not know them. But if they're not my customers, they're not buying from me. If they're not buying from me, they're not as important for my business. Um, and that's where it becomes very important to make 
some adjustment and why to understand the importance of your brand community. So why understanding the, the brand community? So your um, people, let's call them, the people that are interested into your product, into your message, uh, they engage with your content. Uh, so they are the ones that go onto your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, that leave that comment, uh, that also might like your post, share your post, do the simple action, leave a five-star review, this type of things. They produce content uh, when they buy product from you or even without buying product from you, they share visuals on Instagram, they share TikTok video. Um, they feel like they belong to your community. They feel like they belong to the rest of the people that are actually uh, getting your product. And those people, they defend your brand, they advocate it. Uh, so those people, when they go out and someone talks to them about a specific product and they know that you are doing the same, they will be the people that share, hey, I know this brand and they're doing this. Uh, so they publicly talk about your brand, they recommend your brand, and they do it because they want to. It's not that you're not asking them to do anything, they just want to because they're interested in your brand. And as they want to do it, they don't ask for any retribution. So you don't pay them, they're free. And that's where it comes to organic marketing. Those people are actually promoting your brand without even you knowing it and without even you asking for it. Just a little uh, quick catch up on the numbers. Um, as uh, the Nielsen study says, 84% uh, percent of the people uh, that they interview say that they might, uh, they would consider more a referral or recommendation when it comes from a friend. So when people buy more when the recommendation or when someone talks to them and that someone will be in their own community. Uh, so those are the people that are extending your community. For example, I am part of your community. I talk to my friend about your product, then that person becomes also part of your community and that's how you grow it. 90%, 97% uh, of online buyers read reviews before they make a purchase. Those reviews are made by your brand community. So it's very important to understand who is your brand community, but also understand what they want, who they are, mainly because those are the people that li will leave the message that your community and audience in that case will uh, be rich for. And two thirds of customers spend more on brands to which they're loyal. And this is the whole point of it, uh, the better you know your brand community, the more sales you're gonna make uh, and you're gonna build loyalty for your brand. So again, your brand community is your business. They are the people that make you live. They recommend, they engage, they produce, they buy, they give their opinion. Those are the people that make your business not only just a website with product, but a brand that is alive and working. So how to leverage um, this community? How to leverage the power of these people that you have around you? Um, the first, and I think all uh, my fellow presenters today, is, uh, we're all gonna probably repeat the same thing. Um, create conversation, talk to them. Uh, it's, it sounds very simple, uh, but on your day-to-day, -day, you might be busy with your product, your marketing, um, even if Printful is taking care of the rest, um, you still uh, have a busy life and the conversation is still something very important. That's something you need to implement. Um, when I say conversation, it can be an email when someone reach out to support. It can be responding to a comment on Facebook, on Instagram. It can also be uh, you've seen that you've been tagged on an Instagram story, an Instagram post, just leaving a message. Um, this is how you create a connection between you and your community. This is how you get them. You can reward them for their day-to-day -day activities, uh, not only their purchase. Uh, when I was saying what we do as speech, that's something we like to promote. Um, don't only focus on rewarding your customer because they are customers. That's the whole point. They're already buying. They're the people that buy from you. So don't reward them only for the fact that they are doing what they're supposed to do, but reward them for all the little thing they do that makes your business alive. So when someone like your comment, just give them something. When someone uh, posts a picture, just give them something. It will cost you at the very beginning, but it will allow you to create this brand community, this very important community that will make your business grow. So reward them. When I say reward them, it can be rewarded through obviously incentives, but it can be rewarded through just giving them importance, a shout out, for example. Um, so again, give them importance, share their content. Uh, when someone posts a picture of you, just reshare it. It doesn't cost anything. You might not like the picture. It doesn't look professional, but it's authentic and it's uh, done by your community. Publicly acknowledge them. people like to be important, that's uh, human nature. We all like to be on the spotlight, or most of us at least. Um, so when someone do something for you, 
just reward them by showing them that you know them and that you know they're important. Someone, uh, I don't know, send you an email and support and just reply, okay, thanks, thanks for the support, that's amazing, love your brand. Just give them a shout out on social media right after, just like, hey, our client is happy, look at this. Just give them the importance and it will help you uh, build your brand and have better, um, a better image uh, to your audience. Use the knowledge, and that's something very crucial um, that we might focus on the first three uh, most of the time when we understand what is a brand community. It's like, okay, I'll create conversation now. Um, I'm doing rewards, I'm um, giving the importance, I'm sharing content, I'm doing social media, I'm doing loyalty. All right, but what do you learn from this? All those people that are actually generating content for you, they're generating engagement for you, they're building your brand for you, they're also sharing their data with you by doing so. So they're sharing who they are, they're sharing what they want, what they like, they're sharing where they are. So all this data, it's basically your own personal, let's say, pool of information that you can use just to grow even more your community and grow even more your business. So now that you know that most of your clients are women in their 30s, for example, uh, in, I don't know, in Europe, um, this is where it becomes important that when next time you develop your product, well, you might develop them for this segment of people because you already know these are the people that are interested in your product. These are the people that are part of your community. Um, you can also ask them what they want. Those people are here for you. They, they like your brand. They like what you're saying. They're buying your product. They're already engaged with you. So just ask them, um, make them feel that they belong um, where they are. Um, so this will help you reach out better to all those people. And the better you reach out to this community that you now identified and engage, the more this community will grow and grow and grow because each person, each individual that is part of your community also has a community on his own. And that community can be easily reached thanks to that person. So give them importance and use the knowledge, use what you know about them to reach even more people. So what we can do in this is more the action. What, what can you do today after uh, the, the talk? What can you implement in your business? Very simple. First, optimize ads. Some of you might be doing uh, paid. I know today we're here for market uh, for organic marketing, but organic marketing can be used into generating even better paid marketing. So if you're doing this, uh, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, they all have really great tools about lookalike audience, which is basically what you're doing when you understand your community, is that you're taking a knowledge, something that you know about, you're knowing that your customers are these people, you have their information, you have their emails, you have their name, you have their age, you have everything about them, and create lookalike of these people. These lookalike will be even more accurate and even better because you're not reaching out to all your clients, now you're reaching out to, in the pool of the whole community, the people that actually matters the most. Um, reuse the UGC, produce, create authentic customer-centric uh, campaigns. Why not? Instead of spending an hour uh, taking pictures of your own products, why not letting your community do so and share? It's more authentic. Impactful campaign. A-B test, I was saying, ask them. Uh, you're planning on launching a new design. Just ask them which design they prefer. Uh, they will tell you and you will sell more. So that's worth it. Organize exclusive product for them. Uh, you're launching a new line of product. You're launching a new design. Just give them exclusive ac access one day before you actually release it publicly. This will give them, again, they will feel important. Uh, use email marketing. Now that you know, even if they're not paying customers, they are just part of your community and they're engaging with you, you can actually use email marketing now to convert them. Drive sales, uh, obviously offer them discount offers for every single action they do. They did, did 10 likes on Facebook, they shared, your, um, they shared your post on Facebook, just send them a message privately, hey, here's 10% discount. You will not lose, you will always grow thanks to these strategies. Uh, you will turn them into loyal customers and you will identify them. The last point, which is improving your brand experience, is actually the more you know about them and the more you know how they behave on your website, on your social media, it will help you to do better the next time. Um, transform your website. If you ask your community what they like on your website, for example, and they tell you that they go there, 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 just analyze their behavior, analyze where they go, why they go there, uh, why they buy more this t-shirt than this pair of pants, for example. Um, and this will allow you to build better and better every time it's an ongoing process. Um, better and better pages, better and better products, better and better strategies, communication, messages, visuals uh, that will help you grow and have a better and accurate message. 
Thank you for uh, attending today's presentation. That was my part. Um, just to sum up a little bit today, we've seen uh, how to identify your community, the importance of them. Uh, we went very quickly about how and little actions you can implement already into your business. They're free. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more and deeper about the topic, uh, you can always reach out to me. Uh, this is my email, lucas at speech.com, the speech website. Uh, I actually have a great news is that uh, today's speech, uh, we're launching a Shopify integration for our business. And the first 100 accounts will be, have one month free. So don't hesitate to reach out to me and ask uh, to get a free month. And we're also organizing an e-commerce and digital marketing summit in September, uh, which will welcome over 500 attendees, brands like Printful, for example, but also Sephora, L'Oreal, uh, large e-commerces that will share their experience with us. Um, we created a 50% discount codes for you guys. So use Printful threads on the web page, which is just below. Um, and you will get this 50% discount. Um, that's it for my presentation today. If you have any question, reach out to me and I will give it back to Hannah now uh, that will probably uh, be presenting the new speaker. Thank you very much for the first presentation of Printful Threads Volume 4, Lucas. See you again in the Q&A round later. That was Lucas, everyone, from Speech, where he uses his expertise in online communities to help companies reach their ideal customers. Remember, if you have any questions for Lucas, leave them in the comments and feel free to share your insights on social media using the hashtag Printful Threads. Moving right along to our second speaker, our very own head of SEO here at Printful, and my fellow marketing team member, Martin Tchkroza. Martin has been with Printful since 2017, and in that time, he's built up an international team of SEO specialists who help Printful reach its organic growth goals. Simply put, he and his SEO specialists make sure that our content reaches your eyes whenever you search for anything print-on-demand or e-commerce related. Today, he's got a particularly juicy topic in store for you. He's going to share the top SEO mistakes to avoid when trying to boost your brand's visibility. Hey there, Martin. It's great to have you here with us. Take it hey, away Hannah. whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to speak to all of you at Printful Threads. So today I'd like to speak to you about, some, about what I consider to be some of the top SEO mistakes and the do's and don'ts of e-commerce SEO. But before we get into it, let me give you a brief introduction about myself. So, um, as Hannah already mentioned, uh, my name is Martins and I'm the head of SEO at Printful. I'm 31 years old and I've spent the last six years of my life uh, dedicating it to SEO and I'm planning to continue, it, continue doing so. And I've spent the last four years working for Printful, growing the in-house SEO team, developing SEO strategies, and making sure that visitors such as you can find our content online in Google and other search engines. And one thing that I've learned in my years at Printful is that it's never just about SEO. Just like uh, Lucas previously mentioned, brand plays a big role and SEO is just one of the many things that needs to be considered when you're planning a marketing strategy. Uh, because just like nothing grows in vacuum, SEO can't exist on its own, but at the same time, it's also a great marketing strategy that can work on its own as the main strategy if you implement it correctly and it can work great as a supporting strategy for other tactics and strategies that you move in the forefront because one of the things that maybe isn't all that uh, known uh, within with regards to SEO is that many times it's actually the branded keywords that generate the biggest part of organic traffic so if you're building a brand community making sure that your website is optimized and your pages can be found with the correct keywords can also help all of the traffic coming to your site by people who are looking for your specific brand. Nonetheless, uh, if, if I was asked what is the number one mistake that I see people doing with regards to uh, SEO, my answer would be simple, it's not doing SEO. And seriously, if you're not doing SEO, you should be doing SEO. And I'm not just saying that because I'm head of SEO and I'm passionate about what I do. I'm saying it because I believe that it is truly a very cost-effective uh, marketing strategy that works great on its own together with other strategies. And largely that's because uh, organic, uh, sorry, SEO gives you the opportunity to make sure that 
your content is available and users can find it at the exact moment when they are actually looking for it in Google and other search engines. Now, expanding on the number one mistake, uh, the number two mistake that I've seen a lot of uh, online stores and businesses do is leaving SEO for later, which I believe is just as uh, harmful or uh, not the best of things to do because one thing you need to understand is that SEO is a long-term game and it takes a lot of time to see results, especially when your website is new, you're just starting off Organic traffic will not be growing instantly overnight. It will take time to start seeing visitors. It will, stay, it will take time to start growing revenue. And because of that, uh, you need to start planning well ahead of time. And the other thing to remember is that there's always, always, always more work that can be done with regards to SEO. There's always room for improvement. There's new things that you can do. And there's things that you can do to improve whatever you've done in the past as well. And more importantly, um, if you're postponing doing SEO for later, another thing that you're ultimately doing is you're creating extra work that might build up your technical debt. And you're also putting yourself in the risk of having to do things twice, which just puts an extra strain on, on your resources, which might already be uh, very thin, given that you're starting off and you're trying to do as much as possible in many different directions at the same time. So my advice for you with regards to uh, this particular mistake is that you should try and make SEO part of the planning process. Try and incorporate it into the uh, planning part and try and make it a part of every step of your marketing strategy. It doesn't need to be a big part, but making sure that it's part of whatever you're doing on a regular basis will just make sure that you're decreasing that technical debt that might be building up you'll be decreasing the amount of work that you will need to uh, be do, uh, doing later and you'll start seeing results sooner. Now, moving on to number three, uh, the third mistake that I've seen people do is not taking care of SEO basics that aren't all that complicated. Uh, because of lack of time, I'm not gonna be going into all of the basic SEO uh, things. There's a lot of resources that you can look into to find out more about these. But ultimately, my advice to you would be that uh, to learn SEO 101 and make sure that you cover the basics, make sure that covering these basics is part of your strategy and part of the process. And as part of this SEO 101 uh, process, the one thing you need to try and do as soon as, as early as possible uh, is make sure that you do a keyword research and you find keywords that are relevant to your niche and that are relevant with regards to search intent for what it is that you're offering. Um, and one way of doing that is by creating unique content tailored to your specific keywords. Now, uh, the third mistake with regards to basic SEO that I've seen a lot of stores do is not creating enough unique content. And with regards to this particular point, um, the cool thing with uh, solutions such as Printful, there is a lot of content that we offer. So you pretty much have product descriptions and everything ready to go to be added to your store. Uh, and all of this information that we provide is very useful because uh, a lot of it is, for example, technical specs about products, which users need to have to make an informed decision about whether or not they want to buy your product. Uh, but the thing you need to keep in mind is that all of this information, all of this uh, data uh, is duplicated across multiple pages on your own website if you're using the same product with different designs. And the same content can also be found in other websites. And when it comes to Google and other search engines, uh, they tend to uh, depreciate content which is duplicated. Uh, and to combat this, essentially what you should try and do is make sure that you complement your duplicated content which is necessary for your marketing strategy, necessary for your customers, you need to complement this with unique content uh, and this unique content can be tailored uh, around the specific niche that you're trying to target with your products or services. And finally, uh, it's not 
just about the content and just about the keywords when it comes to SEO. Google strives to make content as useful as possible and part of making it useful is making sure that user experience on your website is optimal. So when thinking about optimizing and taking care of the basics, you also need to take care of basics with regards to performance on your website because this is going to help not just SEO, but it's also gonna help your conversion rates. It's also gonna help experience, uh, users experience on your website and ultimately help your bottom line. So my advice with regards to this is that what you should be doing is trying to establish your own step-by-step -step process that you implement uh, and you repeat on a daily basis uh, or weekly or just a regular basis as you work on your website, as you grow it with more products, more services, more content, uh, because that will just make it a lot easier to make sure that basics are covered and when you have the time, when you have the resources, you can start looking into doing more. And to do more, one of the things that you also need to make sure you don't forget is setting up tracking. Uh, and that's another mistake that I've seen many businesses do. Uh, and the thing you need to keep in mind with regards to tracking is that just like uh, organic traffic itself, when you're starting off and if your website traffic is low, uh, data collection will be very slow at the very beginning. And even if you're using paid ads and other channels uh, to drive traffic, if you're thinking about SEO in particular, uh, that data is useful to understand user engagement, user performance on your website, but it's not very insightful when it comes to understanding what works and doesn't with regards to SEO. Uh, to understand what's working for SEO, you need to set up tools that help you get insights about how people find your site, uh, which pages work better, which keywords generate more clicks, uh, and use this information to uh, improve your content. And yeah, because of this, uh, the sooner you set up uh, your tracking, the sooner you will actually start collecting this data, which you can then work with. And the reason why I've added this as one of the top five mistakes uh, in my today's list is that setting up basic tools such as Google Analytics or, or Google Search Console is in fact very easy. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of knowledge. Uh, all it takes is setting up a few tags on your website. There's a lot of automated solutions to do this uh, and creating an account with Google, Search Console, Google Analytics. Both of these platforms are free. So if you haven't done so already, I recommend that you do that as soon as possible uh, because the biggest problem that you might have down the road if you haven't done it already is that at one point you will come to the conclusion that it's time to start analyzing. But if you're only uh, going to set up data tracking tools at the moment when you're ready to start analyzing, you're not going to be able to do much because at that point you will then need to wait until you actually collect enough data to, to start acting on it. And this data collection will take time. Now that's with regards to setting up. Uh, my final mistake that I wanna share with you today is regarding the content and the keywords that you choose. Uh, and one of the, so more specifically, the mistake that I've seen uh, a lot of businesses do is neglecting user search intent when choosing keywords that they want to focus on. Now, uh, the reason why uh, I've included this is because of what Google wants and the type of content that they prioritize. And ultimately, what Google wants is they wanna make sure that the content they serve to users is as useful as possible. And to do this, they try to understand what is the underlying search intent that users have whenever they type a keyword into Google. Uh, and they try to understand it by looking at how people interact with the content that is served to them. Do they like it, do they engage with it, or do they bounce back to Google and continue searching for the same content? Uh, so when you're planning your SEO strategy, the one thing you need to make sure you do is find the right keywords. And finding the right keywords is not just finding keywords that have high search volume. You need to make sure that these keywords also match the content that you're planning to serve for these keywords with regards to the search intent. And uh, a very common example of, um, of how this is done incorrectly on many e-commerce stores that I've seen is, for example, doing a keyword research and finding that 
keywords that begin with the modifier word best are highly popular because people like to search for best print-on-demand services, best camper mag mugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they decide to create products or categories that are called best camper mugs, whatever. Uh, and why this is a mistake is because of the search intent. If we think about the user and his intent when he's typing something like best camper mugs, uh, the search intent is such that the user is not yet ready to make a purchase. He doesn't want to see a bunch of different mugs and then just choose which one has the nicest design. If he's typing best camper mugs, he's probably doing research to try and understand what type of mug best suits his needs, his interests, uh, and the type of content that he is most interested in is some form of comparison between different products or services available. And by not serving the correct uh, type and format of content in this instance, uh, ultimately what you're doing is you're creating content that users won't be interested in uh, and it won't be ranking too well as well. So yeah, uh, to sum up that point, uh, content type and format plays a huge role with regards to relevance uh, of your content to this user's search intent. And the advice that I can give you to make sure that you avoid this mistake is very simple. You can use Google search results to see what already ranks in top positions. Uh, you can click on these top ranking results to see what type of content they have, what format are they using, and use this information, use these insights to determine what kind of content you should be creating, especially if you can spot patterns in the top ranking results that's an indicator that Google clearly knows this is the preferred type of content and that's what you should be doing because unless you're reinventing the wheel and trying to offer something that has never been seen or discussed before, most likely you're better off trying to do the same that already works, just adapt it to your own specific needs rather than trying to do something completely different. Now, these are the five tips that I've shared uh, from my own experience. In addition to this, uh, I would also like to share with you uh, a few tips from my own experience uh, with SEO. And this is also something that we try to do actively at Printful. So number one, uh, what I would recommend you do is you make making sure that you optimize both your product pages and your category pages because the two serve a very different purpose and for SEO the type of keywords that you choose for these is also different. Now if we think about these uh, pages they are different in the sense that a product page is good uh, when a user knows exactly what he wants. So landing on a specific product page looking for that pr specific product is the best thing you can give a user. Uh, at the same time if you are uh, trying to use and target keywords that are more generic. They are um, broader, oftentimes they are in plural form. That's an indicator that users don't actually know what type of product specifically they're looking for. Uh, so the best thing you can do is actually try and give them a choice. Uh, and you can give them a choice by trying to rank your category pages for these specific keywords instead. Uh, so my advice with regards to this is that you should try and use the head keywords or the more generic keywords that usually have a larger search volume. Uh, try and use these for the categories uh, and at the same time use the long tails, the more specific keywords that refer to a very specific product in your collection. Uh, use these on the product pages and you can incorporate them in the page type, in the product names or in the descriptions. Uh, and other SEO 101 uh, positions. But yes, just kind of think about where you place your keywords and which content you want to uh, target with what type of keywords. And yeah, another advice with regards to this that I have for you is that you shouldn't be trying to compete for the very, very uh, generic keywords that the ones that aren't even related to your specific niche, uh, largely because these keywords are oftentimes too broad for your content to rank simply because of who the competitors for those keywords are. When it comes to the most generic keywords, 
it's the huge websites, the corporations, the, the very large old domain websites with a lot of authority that are trying to rank for them and they have a lot of resources and time uh, to, to actually make it happen. So by trying to target these keywords, uh, you're basically kind of setting yourself up to fail or setting yourself up for a very, very long run until you actually start seeing results. Uh, and ultimately, uh, if you think about what's more valuable for you or, and your business, um, coming back to the point about search intent, if you focus on keywords that have, let's say, 100 searches per month uh, and you serve content that will fit 90% of the users who are using these keywords to look for something, you'll be getting 90% of that traffic, so 90 clicks. At the same time, if you're trying to target a keyword that has a thousand search volume, but at best it might be 5% of these users uh, who are interested in your specific product, even the math is against you because in that case you would still be getting some traffic, but you would be getting la less traffic from higher search volume keywords than you would be if you would be targeting uh, the more valuable, the more specific keywords related to your specific niche. Now, moving on to my tip number two, uh, internal links uh, that do make a big difference. And internal linking is my tip number two, not just because it's important for SEO, it's also because it's important for uh, other factors as well, such as conversion rates and user experience on your site. If you have optimal uh, and streamlined internal linking between your content, between your pages, uh, users will be able to find what they're looking for and if they haven't found what they're looking for on the page that they arrived on, they will be easily able to navigate to another page and potentially find exactly what it is that they came to find. And the other reason why uh, I'm emphasizing uh, this particular point is because it's also very, very important for SEO's ranking factors. Uh, so Google uses internal links to try and understand how your content is related uh, and, and what keywords your content is about. Uh, and with that regard, uh, in, in content links, the, content, uh, the links that you find within the body copy of your content uh, are generally far more valuable uh, for SEO than the general site-wide links that you would find in the header navigation, the sidebar or the footer. Uh, because of the context that surrounds them. It helps search engines understand what it is that uh, you're talking about, and it helps kind of pass on some of the authority of that link onto the other page that you're linking to. Um, and this linking to other pages, what it does, it essentially helps you build silos of topically related pages, uh, which will ultimately help strengthen your website's overall relevance uh, to a particular topic. So um, the way Google works is that they look at websites and they try to figure out what areas are these websites uh, experts or authorities in, uh, and they use the content that is found on these websites to determine what are the topics that these websites cover in depth and should deserve to rank for. So using internal links to connect different pages that are related to that same topic will help search engines better understand and find all that different content that you have related to a specific topic. Uh, and when it comes to e-commerce, uh, a topic can be even something as simple as a specific theme that you're kind of trying to build within your product catalog. Uh, so connecting different products and different categories related to to a specific theme will again help improve uh, internal link, internal linking signals that are important for SEO and also for users who are just looking for something within that theme, but maybe not quite the product that they uh, found on the first page they arrived in. And um, my last point with regards to this uh, tip is you need to remember that there is no hover state on mobile. Uh, so to elaborate on this, um, hover state is the action of moving your mouse over uh, a navigational item, for example, the header menu, uh, and then seeing something happen. Uh, hover state is something that only uh, happens on desktop. Uh, and as a result, uh, the thing that I've seen on many websites is that uh, websites build 
header menus where uh, you have a drop down menu show up when you hover over a specific item in the header. Uh, and then the item in the header itself also serves as a link if you click on it. Uh, now, the thing you need to remember is that there is only one action on mobile devices. Uh, you cannot have a hover state with your fingers. So there's only the click and on mobile, uh, the click will serve as the hover on desktop. So if you click on a link on mobile, it will open up the, the drop down. Uh, but what this means is that there is no action to actually visit the page that you would visit if you clicked on that link on desktop, unless there is some other solution set up for this. And one of the solutions that you can do to address this issue is create a second link to that very same page within the drop down that uh, this, this hover menu shows up uh, for. And uh, to make it even more user friendly, the other thing that you can do is make this link visible only on mobile devices, uh, which is relatively simple, uh, depending on what platform you're using, of course. Uh, but that way you will kind of make sure that users coming to your website through mobile can find all of the pages and all of the links uh, that you're offering without interfering with the user experience of the users who use your website on a desktop. Now, to finish off, uh, my tip number three for you today is make use of landing pages because that's one of the things that I find is kind of undervalued and underused in many e-commerce stores that focus on building up a catalog, building up product pages, uh, and trying to rank for a lot of difficult keywords, but not really getting to the top positions. And the reason many catalogs and um, product pages aren't able to get to the top positions uh, in Google search results is simply because category and product pages generally have a very rigid structure. There are limits to what you can do with SEO because a category page needs to have a grid where you see all of the, the products. Uh, a product page needs to have a section where there's the image, there's the product description, and they follow a very, very specific structure uh, which is very good for user experience when it comes to understanding what's offered, what's available and understanding what the product is all about. Uh, but if we think about optimizing all of the different positions that are important for SEO, product pages and category pages offer very limited uh, options to do this. On the other hand, landing pages uh, are the exact opposite because with landing pages, the entire page is your canvas and you can pretty much tailor the content and the images and whatever else you put on your page to the keywords that you want this page to rank for. And you can incorporate these keywords in the top of the page. You can add paragraphs uh, to expand on the keyword, to give it more relevance, to give it content context, which will kind of signal, uh, send stronger signals to Google that you're talking about that specific keyword and you deserve to rank. Um, and ultimately, it will just give you a lot more freedom to actually try and get uh, the page more optimized for SEO so that it's able to reach those higher positions that a category page isn't able to reach. And um, when thinking about what you should or could build landing pages for, uh, my recommendation would be that you can do this for any type of more general keywords that are valuable to your business. So if a category isn't performing too well and you're seeing that like there's not much traffic going there, but the keyword is valuable, you really wanna rank in top positions, you can try and maybe de-optimize the category and optimize a landing page for that specific keyword by adding more content uh, around it. You can pick themes, for example, you know, seasonal stuff that, that you do uh, for holidays. It can be great for marketing activities and marketing campaigns uh, of other types as well. But in addition to that, you can also help boost uh, your positions for those specific um, keywords. And when you do this, when you build pages, uh, make sure that you always add a call to action as well. And a call to action is usually uh, a button or whatever else that is ultimately a link to another page. And this is where uh, landing pages also come in handy as a solution for 
developing silos uh, where you can have the landing page linked to specific categories within your product catalog, for example, related to a theme that you're discussing on your landing page, or you can link to specific products that are uh, that belong to the category for which you uh, ultimately had this keyword reserved for, but then decided to build a landing page itself instead. And of course, uh, these internal links will send uh, signals that will help boost uh, all the other pages as well. So those were my tips and mistakes that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I hope you found all of this useful uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing some more questions from uh, all of you later on uh, and answering them in the Q&A. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your presentation, Martin. We'll get back to you later in the Q&A. If any of you have any questions already for Martin, you can keep thinking about them or you can comment them already in the comments section. Make sure to put his name so that we know who to ask. And if you feel like it, you can share what you've learned already on social media using the hashtag PrintfulThreads. Remember that we'll be randomly selecting three lucky winners to get a $30 coupon, so the more comments, the merrier. Now it's time to give it over to Sandy Jandu, who's going to talk about how to be the friend you'd trust in order to grow your community and business. Sandy is a real jack of all trades. She runs the Instagram account Ellie Home, which has over 13,000 followers. On this account, she shares DIY inspiration by showing not only the end product, but also the process that goes along with her DIY projects. And of course, she executes the projects themselves, spanning everything from a faux brick wall in her living room to a puzzle piece end table. She also sells merch using Printful, like t-shirts and hats for her Ellie crew. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Sandy. Take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And yes, we're talking about how to grow your business organically. And really, this is a message about being people first. So before we get started, I'll give you a little bit of um, an intro about me. Um, yes, I own um, Ellie home and I'm a lifestyle content creator with a focus on DIY and design. My background is actually in art and English education as well as information systems technology, which is a weird mix, I know, but uh, I really love being able to create with both sides of my brain and I think it's really helped me build out my community as well. My community that I've built largely on Instagram is over 14,000 people strong, and it is an incredibly tight-knit uh, group of folks that know that they can trust what I recommend. And we're going to talk about how exactly I've been able to build that um, as we go through this. So what we're going to cover today are really answering three questions. One is, what business do you have? It's a really simple question to answer. Once we go through that, we'll talk about the bulk of the presentation, which is around what's your why? And there's going to be two sides to that coin that we'll cover. And finally, we'll cover who are your people? Because at the end of the day, and I'm going to keep saying this, I'll say this a bunch of times, you're cultivating a community, not a customer. So you really want to uh, keep that in mind because I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> so let's start with looking at your business. What business do you have? Is it product directed or product supplemented? That seems like a really easy question to answer, right? And it should be. So product directed is your primary source of income, the product that you're actually trying to sell. So are you selling your artwork? Are you selling t-shirts and merch or mugs? Is that the primary uh, income stream that's coming in uh, for your business? Or are you product supplemented? Meaning that you have your platform, you have your business, and you have products that supplement it. So for example, with my business, I'm a lifestyle content creator, and I inspire people to do projects in their own home. So you can see up here, I've got a couple of my t-shirts that people really love. Um, and I always talk about how people can uh, use these as their paint shirts or um, use them at, when they go out to Home Depot to give them a little bit of courage if they're buying their first power tool. Um, so the products actually uh, supplement the message that I'm trying to get across. And once you answer that question, that's really going to help guide your messaging and your communications um, as we move through to build your community. All right, you're still with me? So let's keep going. So the bulk of what we're looking at is what is your why? What is your business purpose? Because your purpose is actually not what you're selling, right? Your purpose is the message that you're trying to get, 
get across. So for example, for me, I want to inspire people to love the homes that they're in. So how do I get that across? Right now, social media is really blurring the lines between storefronts and the people behind those storefronts. So you really need to think about how you can inject yourself into the content that you're creating or the messages that you're sending in order to get, um, you know, grow your community in return. So my business purpose, if it's really to inspire people um, to love their homes, then I'm going to be thinking about how I can create content and how I can create merchandise that will support that message. But in addition, that's not all I talk about. I also talk about my interests because my community is really interested in what I have to say and what I'm interested in. Just like you're making friends, you know, as a kid at the playground, you want to know what the other, what, uh, what your friends are interested in. So you have to think about what your interests are and figure out what of those you're comfortable sharing on social media. So in addition to sharing about DIY and design, for example, I share a lot about anti-racism practices. I share a lot of food content. I share a lot of uh, content around the books that I'm reading. I have figured out what my interests, uh, my community is interested in, and I make sure to share them. So once you've figured out your purpose and you've figured out which of your interests you're comfortable sharing on your platform, you can merge those two to figure out your why. So for me then, my why is to be, to have an inclusive platform with people that are also interested in DIY and design. So I hope that makes sense. But it's not all about you, right? We are trying to build community. We're trying to cultivate um, this trusted community. So you also then have to think about your audience. Who is your ideal audience? There are so many ways and there are amazing marketing experts out there who can um, really go into this in detail. But at its crux, you're thinking about who is the ideal. So you can do that in a couple of ways. You can list out um, features that they might have. You could also think about them in terms of an avatar. So think about one person that would be your ideal friend that you're trying to make to build out this community who could potentially then become a customer. So for me, for example, my ideal um, audience member is going to be a working parent who really wants to come home and feel like they're in their space, that it belongs to them and they have put their stamp on it. You also then want to think about what their interests are. Are they inclusive? Is their, mess is their home um, you know, kid-friendly, pet-friendly? Um, are they interested in bold color? That sort of thing. You want to think about what they're into. What books do they read? What movies do they watch? And then you want to incorporate those into your why so that now we've created this circle between what you're sharing with your audience and what they're sharing with you because they really, really want to get to know you. And if they want to get to know you, then you should want to get to know them. Okay. So then we start to look at who are your people then, all right? So you've figured out your why. You've really done the work to figure out what your interest is and what your business purpose is. And you've figured out how you want to reciprocate that with your folks. To find out that kind of information, you can also do polls on social media. So you can ask, you know, um, are folks interested in DIY or design more? Or are folks interested in um, mugs or water bottles more? There's a whole bunch of questions that you can, that you can use. You can ask about people's um, interest in movies, in books, that sort of thing. And then you're going to really understand who your audience is, who are your people, because they will share your purpose and their interests, and they will trust that you reciprocate. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. What you're going to do when you figure out your why and your core messaging is you're going to share that message regularly and often. So you can kind of see in my branding in my presentation and on my shirt, it says, do what you love always. That has become like the mantra for Ellie Home and everything that I do. And I share that message regularly and often. And I don't do it to try to be, you know, manipulate the system or to try to get something from people. I genuinely believe it. And it's genuinely my purpose for this work that I do. And that comes across in the authentic way that I engage with people. So 
now what I'm doing then over time is I'm only sharing brand partnerships that I know my audience will be interested in and that they trust that I really love too. I'm only sharing projects that are applicable to my home or my client's homes that I also know will be reciprocated with my audience. And if people share information with me or projects with me that they that I've inspired, I'm sharing that widely as well. So it really goes both ways. The other thing um, that uh, Lucas mentioned earlier as well is when people message you, when they comment on your posts or other posts and they've tagged you, you want to respond to every single comment that you get. I know our days are busy. I know that it gets really difficult, but there are ways that you can use quick text to um, have a series of responses that you want to give to folks. But more often than not, I want you to really be thoughtful about how you're engaging with this community because they're messaging you because they really want to engage with you. They want to be there. They want to be a part of your community. And that's a really powerful privilege to have. So if someone comments on my uh, Instagram post, for example, I'm commenting back usually um, immediately. I spend a, a couple hours in the morning doing that. If someone DMs me, they're probably going to get like a you know an in-depth conversation because I genuinely want to get to know them. And when you do that, when you start to engage with these folks, they start to not just see you as a storefront. They start to not just see you as someone who um, you know is out there selling product things like that, they start to see you as a friend, as a community member. Um, to that end as well, I've stopped seeing like followers on social media and I say community members because it really is allowing me to think of these folks as my peers and allowing them to see the same. So to close out then, it can really be daunting to create a customer base, but if you incorporate these tips, if you really think about what messages you're trying to, to say, so for example, um, my message is I want to inspire folks to love their home, homes they're in. And if you just really lead with that, so for, you know, like I'm saying here, if you lead with your heart and really think about being per people first, the return on that is going to be more impactful than just throwing um, merch in someone's way. So creating a community of trusting and engaged people is all about the energy that you're putting out first so that then those folks will come back and trust what you have to say. Um, that is all from me. And I can be found anywhere and everywhere at Ellie Home. Um, yeah, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much for your presentation, Sandy. That was very insightful Thank and you. very thorough. Yes. Awesome. So leave your questions for Sandy in the comments below as per usual, and don't forget to mention that they're for her. You can also go ahead and share your takeaways on social media, like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or otherwise, using the hashtag Printful Threads. It's time now for a 10-minute break for you to refresh some beverages, maybe grab a snack. Might I recommend some fruits and vegetables that are in season where you're at? or maybe something a little less healthy. <laughs> when we get back, we'll take a look at what you guys have been sharing on social media so far.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're feeling refreshed and you've got some drinks and snacks for the remainder of our presentations and Q&A. You might have noticed that we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, but not to worry. That means that we have a longer time for the Q&A at the end. Before we get started with Nico's presentation, let's pull up what you guys have been sharing on social media so far. It looks like we've got a lot of first-time business um, owners or people who are just getting started with Printful or are planning to get started, to which I say, excellent. Hopefully this uh, conference will give you guys the inspiration that you need to take that first step. Um, and if you're a seasoned business owner, we hope you're also learning a lot. Um, yeah, and definitely reward your brand community for their engagement, not only their purchases. Great takeaway. We heard that both from Sandy and from Lucas. And last but not least, we've got this amazing um, furry friend who seems to be turning, tuning in and hopefully is learning a lot about organic marketing as well on Instagram. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing your takeaways. You can keep doing so. And remember that three lucky winners will get $30 coupons uh, for using the hashtag Printful Threads on social media. So last but not least, we've got just enough time for Nico Rojas, social media consultant, brand strategist, and budding TikTok star. Nico's been working for about six years on brand strategy and marketing strategy, but it's only taken him four months to grow a captive audience of over 100,000 followers on TikTok. We even tried to get him to condense his presentation down into a one minute video, but it turns out that what he had to say was just too detailed for that. Welcome, Nico. We can't wait to hear what you have to say about crushing it on TikTok and reaching your ideal audience. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm excited to be here and be able to share with you how to crush it on TikTok and reach your ideal audience. A little bit of, uh, about me, you know, like you mentioned, I've been uh, working with brands for over six years, helping them stand out online and grow an audience online. Uh, without, further ado, without further ado, let's get into the presentation. So first and foremost, why TikTok? Well, you know, TikTok, uh, the obvious reason, it has insane organic reach. Uh, it's the first time ever that somebody is able to post their very first video and get over 1 million views. Um, the second thing is that it's the relevant platform. It's the platform in which everyone is on, right? Uh, this is the one that um, everybody's using for that same reason. It's the spotlight effect that you can get on there and essentially be exposed to uh, an insane amount of people, amount of people at, at, at one time, right? And, and essentially, you just don't know when that's going to happen. The next thing is that the content on TikTok is, is evergreen, right? You can post a video today and in 12 months, that same video could still be uh, trending, right? Or, or, uh, or a different video that didn't perform so well could then boost up um, in 12 months from now, right? The, uh, the last reason is because the content that you create on TikTok, you can then repurpose that and use that and share it on other platforms like Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Snapchat, and even YouTube, right? So how does TikTok work? Well, it, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, everybody gets on the For You page, right? It's a, it's the For You page is sort of like the discoverability uh, um, feature of TikTok, right? That's how you, your content gets discovered. So if you post a video, you're, you're definitely going to be discovered by a certain mountain number of, of uh, people. And usually that number is around 100, right? And then based on the metrics of those of first 100 people, that determines whether it gets pushed to more people, to 500, 1,000, and so on, right? Uh, so the For You page is not universal every for you page is different is it's unique to you so the app learns uh, about the type of content that you like about the type of content that you engage with and based on that it shows you content that's relevant to what you are used to interacting with and what you enjoy right hashtags are used to categorize your TikTok videos. So when you use hashtags, you want to make sure that they're relevant to the content because that's how the app is going to understand and uh, learn that your content is uh, geared to a specific niche or to a specific group of people. Um, the next thing is captions on TikTok. Well, they're short, right? So that's another way that TikTok understands the type of content you're putting out. So keep your content, your, your captions short. They're not like Instagram where you can put a whole paragraph or, or on Facebook. Here it's like a one to two sentences. 
But that's the basics of how TikTok works. Uh, let's talk about trends, right? So what are trends? Well, trends come into in different forms. They come in forms of challenges. They come in forms of songs, hashtags, and even filters. And sometimes a trend can be composed of multiple of these things, right? They can be uh, all four together, right? So as you see, you probably recognize this image on here. It, it went viral, uh, basically for the use of a uh, an action. The person was riding on a skateboard, drinking some juice, but also singing a song and that formed a trend, right? So utilize trends that are relevant to your brand and uh, that fit your brand, but you can use either a specific challenge or you can uh, get involved in a, in a trend that utilizes all four of these, these uh, different types of trends. And that way your video has a better chance of uh, reaching more people. So let's talk about how you crush it on TikTok, right? So consistency is key. Um, like I said, the first few videos, could absolutely do amazing, but at the same time, they could not, right? So it's important that you stay consistent, that you try and you test because you, you have to give the app the opportunity to learn about your content, to learn about the type of content that you're putting out there. So you wanna make sure your video length are nice and short, TikTok started uh, as a platform with short form video. Now it's migrated to like up to three minutes long. But again, the nature of the platform is still there. That is short form. So you want to keep your videos short and form while you're testing, while you're, um, you know, finding out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Then I would move on to longer format video once you've established an audience and use that longer format to nurture that audience and build that community. You can use video replies. So on TikTok, you have the ability to reply to your audience's comments using videos. This is a great way to get them involved, to build your community and essentially engage your audience. Now, of course, if you don't know what to post one day, because on TikTok content is evergreen, you can post the same video and it'll be shown to a different batch of people, right? And, and sometimes a video that you post the second time performs better than it did the first time. So those are kind of like the basic rules of how you can crush it on TikTok. Let's talk about content strategy, right? So uh, when, you, when it comes to your content strategy, you wanna make sure you have some goals. You wanna set some goals. You wanna have some milestones, some indicators that uh, let you know that you're on the right track, right? Um, so for example, if you're trying to grow your audience, you wanna set a milestone of, okay, I'm gonna post one to two times a day or even one to two times a week, whatever that is. But it, it, as long as you're hitting that milestone, you know you're on the right track. The next thing is you wanna have content pillars, right? So I have this diagram here on the right-hand side. Basically, it says your content should be right in between what you wanna say and what your audience is interested in, right? So this is where you're going to have to do some audience research, understand your audience. And, and a great way to do that is to do some competitive research, some competitive analysis and see what other accounts are putting out there and how are people reacting to those, to that type of content and then kind of go off from there. Um, the next thing, you know, should you post more or should you post higher quality? Well, at the beginning, I would recommend you post more so that you can learn to see what is resonating and what is not resonating, right? And then as you are cons consistently putting out content, you're gonna start to learn also about your content and you're gonna start uh, basically owning in on your content creation process and your content is ultimately gonna be become better. You also wanna make sure you have a call to action at the end of your video. Right. You want to ensure that you're telling your viewer what it is that you want them to do next when it comes to your content. So make sure that you're either telling them to, you know, follow your account, to give you a like, to leave you a comment or even send them to the link in your bio, right? Your online store. So, but always have a call to action as is it as because it's very, very important. Um, so your TikTok viral checklist. First things first, you wanna capture their attention. So the first second is crucial. You wanna make sure you grab their attention. And once you grab your attention, you wanna hook them in and keep them interested. That's where the first sentence comes in. Whether it's a, a, uh, a hook on like a little 
sentence or headline that you add overlay on the video or it's something that you say, but whatever it is, you want to make sure you grab their attention. Next, you want to give them what they came for. So you want to deliver that value, right? Um, and, and of course, take out what you don't need. Sometimes, you know, because of how we put out our content, we think, we think a certain way, but really, um, it, 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 it can be considered uh, uninteresting to somebody else. So take out what you don't need, simplify your content and make it super understandable, make it, make it so that everybody understands what your content is and that they get your content within the first few seconds. Uh, next thing is you want to use uh, trending sounds. You want to use popular sounds because it adds to that familiarity effect, right? When you hear something familiar, you're more likely to watch it. Um, on top of that, you want to use hashtags, hashtags that are, aren't oversaturated and also so that TikTok knows how to categorize your content. So rule of thumb is you wanna use hashtags that are within the 1 million to 10 million traffic range, right? Um, and then second to last is be different. Now this doesn't mean at all that you need to create your own trends or that you need to essentially do completely, something completely different than from what everybody else is doing. This simply just means, um, you know, if you do if you do something that's already done, add your own unique style to it so that you differentiate yourself from everybody else. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to find your own way of spinning it. Last but not least, you need to engage. Engage, engage, engage. And engaging on TikTok is a little bit different than engaging on Instagram. You're not necessarily doing outreach to get exposed, to be to reach more exposure, but you're engaging to to sort of activate the algorithm and let the algorithm know that your content is performing well. So you wanna make sure you engage with your audience. When they leave you a comment, you wanna engage with them, you wanna reply and uh, let them know that you're here for them as you're building your, your TikTok audience as well. So last but not least, you wanna test and measure. You wanna make sure that you're watching, you're auditing your account, you're seeing what your total play times are. You're also, um, you know, what your average watch time is, right? Because all these indicators are going to let you know what's performing well and what isn't. What you can tweak and adjust so that it does perform well the second time. Also understand where your traffic source type is coming from, right? Um, it, when a video does really well on TikTok, nine out of 10, it's gonna come from the For You page, right? It's the discoverability aspect of it that, that it's gonna be new people. But keep in mind, because sometimes it might not do well on the For You page, but it will do well on your, uh, based on like your following count, right? So keep that in mind, that way you can learn to see what's, what's performing well in terms of your already established audience or the new ad audience that you're going out there. Take a look at where your followers are from, right? One of the things that I noticed for me is that I was getting a lot of uh, traffic from all over the world. So then I started implementing captions into my videos so that I, I can make sure that, you know, maybe they could, if, if they don't speak, if English isn't their first language, then they could pause it and read it, right? So understanding who your audience is and where they're coming from is essential. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me to share this with you. Um, I hope you, know, you take the information and you implement it and you can go out and crush it. Thank you so much, Nico, for your presentation. That was the final presentation of Printful Threads. Uh, but it's not time to close your laptop just yet. We've still got the Q&A round in store for you with the questions you asked on social media. All right, it's time to get everybody back up on the screen. Let's see your lovely faces. All right, there we all are. Okay, I'm gonna start the Q&A round off with a question that's open-ended for anyone. Um, and it's, how do you start your community? What are the first steps you should take and maybe the best social media platform for that? Sandy, do you have any tips perhaps? I mean, Instagram was perfect for me, but I think uh, 
now, if someone was starting now, I would actually say to start with TikTok uh, because, you know, like Nico has alluded to, I mean, if you set things up right, the ability to grow there is, is exponential. And the community on TikTok is more honest and more authentic than like any other social <laughs> platform that I've seen. Um, so I think it would be to just again like think about that core messaging that you want to that you want to share with people like what the heck it is it is that you want to say, and start sharing it on TikTok. It's so much easier because like you don't you don't have to like have something that's like perfectly formatted or you know perfect photos or anything like that. You can just talk to camera, um, and someone will listen. Mm -hmm. I was I was just gonna add to it actually, um, uh, and and I'm going to with. Uh, Cindy's uh, comment right now. I think TikTok is a great way to start uh, the community and, and to start getting uh, the reach and the visibility for the brand uh, because of what uh, Nico explained that you can get literally millions of you uh, on, on your first video. So it's a great tool for awareness. Um, I would say though, not to forget uh, to select wisely the platform you're on and maybe TikTok might be great for awareness, but I don't think Today, TikTok is ready yet to be uh, like a social commerce platform. So I don't see people buying yet that much on, on TikTok. Um, but you can um, switch them and, and use the TikTok uh, basically to, to like send them towards a Facebook page, an Instagram page, which then uh, basically once you have this big community of, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, millions of people following your brand, you can just retarget them and, and get them to buy your products Absolutely. So while we're on the topic of TikTok, um, Nico, we had a question. If you're not a part of Gen Z, do you think that you can still crush it on TikTok? And what are your sort of tips for maybe some slightly older people who want to get um, involved on this platform? Absolutely. I definitely think that you could still crush it on TikTok. I mean, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm considered Gen Z myself. I'm 25 years old, soon to be 26. So I definitely think that you could still question on TikTok. In terms of how you do it, you know, it is the popular platform. Usually when somebody starts, uh, when, when, a pop, when a platform becomes popular, it's usually taken over by the younger generations. And then as, as marketers or as uh, business people, we see where the attention is and then slowly that older crowd starts you know, uh, driving towards that same platform. So uh, now, nowadays, I think we are seeing more of an older group on TikTok as well. So I definitely think that if you're not part of the Gen Z, you, there's still a big opportunity um, to be successful on TikTok. I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, I'm 40 and I'm obsessed with TikTok, so I'll just leave that out right now. <laughs> but you don't have to be a youngin to um, to really use it um, as a platform. Yeah, and, and actually uh, I've seen brands doing amazing brands that you might not expect on TikTok, you know, like you might expect the very young brands to go on TikTok and, and crush it as, as Nico said, but um, I've seen, for example, I think was L'Oreal in Europe, uh, that did some cosmetic campaigns on TikTok organically and they just like basically set the game for any brand that want to join TikTok. So so I think there is literally a place for, for everyone on TikTok and it's becoming popular amongst almost all generations. Moving on from talking about social media to perhaps going to email, Lucas, there was a question for you which was, when starting out building a customer base, should somebody focus on building a community on social media first or an email mailing list? Okay, so I mean, the, the email, which is probably I would say the more traditional kind of old fashioned way of, of doing business, um, I don't think one uh, exclude the other one. So I think uh, as we just mentioned uh, at, at the beginning now that social should go first and for example TikTok and and all those platforms just because they allow you to to reach more people uh, you you will need the email of your customers you will need the email of of those people that are part of your community but that will come later i think to set your business to set your brand for success first off you you should focus on social mainly because it's live it's it's in a live platform email or static um social media always evolve, you can have conversation, which is a bit harder on, on email. And it's also where they are. That's where the audience is right now. It's, it's social media. It can be TikTok, Instagram, 
LinkedIn, Pinterest, can be anywhere. Um, and, and as I was mentioning during, during my talk, you can always use the, uh, I like to use the reward strategy to get the email after that. Um, and, and I saw some of the comments that were mentioning, yeah, but like if my business is uh, like just starting, I might not have, you know, the rewards to set. Uh, and I just want to like, if you want to have, once, once you have this reach and this awareness into your community and, and you got those people on social, when I said reward for their like, for their comments, it doesn't mean that you have to give them a free product for reward. Uh, you can give them a shout out on social media for, for something. You can send them a, a sticker. Uh, I know Printful does, does stickers. So for example, you could, you could do that. There is millions of ways you can reward the community with not always material stuff, but also just little gesture that makes it worth it for them and for you. Uh, Sandy was mentioning about responding to every single comment. For me, that's also considered a reward because you are rewarding them for their engagement. You're just creating a conversation with them. Um, so yeah, definitely, I would say uh, start start with social. Social is where you should be anyway. Um, select wisely the platform you're on. Build your community there. And when you reach your objective, hundreds, thousands of followers, then it's time to convert them and to get them into um, into your brand and with their email. Uh, but don't, don't rush it, even if, if I'm like, for a lot of people, time is crucial and, and you want to get your sales fast, you want to grow fast. I think you, you should first focus on growing this, this kind of organic um, and, and maybe Martin Ruiz will, will, will be go on my side when I say that the more those people will interact with your brand on social media, the more they will create content for you, the more they will engage on comments, the more uh, the better it is for the SEO because I believe that will also have a great impact on your business. No. Definitely, and uh, that's maybe one, one thing with social media is that uh, as far as uh, direct impact on, on SEO uh, through linking, uh, this is something that Google has kind of depreciated a lot, uh, largely because uh, social media has been abused for SEO purposes in the past. For example, with, with all the many different uh, like and share to win a scooter campaigns and stuff like that where you know you get a link which supposedly should indicate that you have quality content but ultimately that's not what you're getting that link from on social media so google has kind of dropped the value of this part of social media but at the same time the thing that you're referring to engagement on social media is is still a very important factor that google looks at and they kind of they value the fact that there is engagement going on with your brand, with your website, maybe through through that social media account or anything else. And because of this, it kind of makes them also realize that like, hey, there's things going on with your website, like we should be paying attention to. We should give, be giving you a chance to, uh, to see if you deserve to rank in top positions. Because, you know, getting a new business to rank as well, like, or as far as like, if you have a website and, and you're trying to get in top positions, uh, goes it's usually the case that you start off by kind of ranking for a lot of keywords and then Google tries to just drop you for all of the ones that you're not relevant for but trying to rank for all of these keywords like you know signals such as social media engagement is very helpful to actually uh, encourage this kind of uh, action from Google as well also just to add on, on top of that um, when when focusing on, on social media um, I just like to put myself as a customer also, and that's something that I think everyone should do. Um, and if today I'm receiving an email from a brand directly into my inbox, and then I cannot find them on social media, because obviously that's the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna Instagram them, I'm gonna TikTok, you know, Facebook, I'm gonna look for them, I'm gonna see the content, and I don't find them, or I find them, but with little or no engagement or following, then I'm not responding to that email. But if first I get to know them, uh, I get to get a trust and, and the authenticity of the brand and the feel of the brand. And then I get an email from that brand. I'm way more likely to interact, to engage and to buy uh, as an end goal anyway. I love that so much because that's exactly what people do. And that's like what I was talking about with, you know, how do you build trust? Well, people are your customers, your community is going to come check you out. They're going to come see what, you know, who, the face behind the brand. I also wanted to share um, because what you were saying about rewards, like they don't have to be something that you purchase to share. There's also digital rewards that you can give. I follow artists who regularly, weekly will share like um, digital wallpapers that you can screenshot and use for your phone. 
So it's something that, and I do it too, I'll put like the logo on a, you know, a story wallpaper and people will grab it for their phone. So there's ways to like create stuff that, you know, is really easy for you to, to put together. It doesn't cost anything. And yet you're still rewarding this community for, for being there. Yeah, I, I like the digital uh, fact that you just mentioned. I was actually uh, just this week working with a client that I, that I can't mention, obviously, uh, but on their rewarding strategy. Uh, it's very large brand. And the first thing they said when working on their reward was like, hey, why don't we offer uh, like phone background and like a digital assets to make behind presentations when you talk on, you know, on, on Zoom or on Google Meet and this type of things. And, and I'm, I believe there will be the first rewards to be to be taken by their community because yeah. that's just easy and people love it. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, Sandy, this is a question that we got for you. Do you think people who buy your products just to support you or your community will become your long long term buyers? So I I don't think that would happen automatically, right? Because especially if I'm selling uh, a t-shirt that has this logo, someone's probably not going to buy the same t-shirt for themselves, right? So I think there would be two factors. If they know it's good quality, which I know it is because I'm using Printful to, to create the shirt, that's going to be uh, like a notch in my favor because they're going to come back and buy a different shirt knowing that it's the same quality. But the other thing is that I think it's it's got to be on us as the brand, as their creators, to make sure we're always being creative and delivering more so i'm not gonna have you know just my set five t-shirts for example and that's it i'm never gonna look at them again it's up to me to provide new materials and new merch that they would then want to to come back and get um so far it's working <laughs> so um yeah excellent okay martin this one's for you could you speak for a few minutes about differences and correlations between keywords and search intent? Sure, uh, I would be happy to. Uh, so, yeah, I, as I mentioned already in my um, presentation, basically with, with Google nowadays, uh, you know, they're not just interested in trying to match keywords with uh, pages that have these keywords on them. Uh, it's all about understanding what content is actually desired by the user. Uh, and with regards to search intent in particular, there's, there's a lot of resources and a lot of theories around it, but I think the one thing that, uh, if you're building your website, the one thing that you need to keep in mind is uh, sort of the concept of, ha of having different types of search intent, uh, which ultimately determine what type of content users will be looking for. Uh, and there's a relatively easy way to kind of figure out what type of content is expected by just looking at the keywords. Uh, so if we think about the types, uh, we can kind of generalize uh, that there are four types of uh, search intents. Uh, and uh, I think a resource that I read in Ahrefs uh, kind of defined them as informational, navigational, transactional, and commercial in commercial investigation and to some extent they're also tied in with the marketing funnel where you kind of go through the stages until you decide to purchase uh, but kind of breaking down these uh, types uh, if we think about the informational type of search intent that's ultimately all of the keywords that users use to look for information and you know when they use these keywords they're ultimately they're not looking for products they're not looking to buy they want information and in these instances uh, it's the long form content or comparison of different things but it's the long form content uh, that people are most interested in and these are generally the kind of keywords that you would see um, the question modifiers in front like how why where which uh, you know, when people look for something like that, you obviously see that like what they want is an answer to their question or like a bigger story around that question. But ultimately, the type of content you need to create is, um, you know, long form blog posts. Uh, and, and the other thing that I think is also important to note is that um, the navigational type keywords, these are sometimes keywords that people think will generate a lot of traffic when you kind of try to rank for a competitor's name uh, by, let's say, mentioning their, their, their brand on your store. Uh, but 
Navigational keywords, uh, many of which are in fact brand names, uh, are generally used by people who are too lazy to add that .com in the browser. So they just write TikTok and then they Google it and then they click the link in Google. And this is how a lot of ultimately organic traffic is generated, but it's actually branded navigational traffic that serves just one, in, one purpose, which is to get the user to the actual platform. Uh, and you know, if we use TikTok as an example, uh, somebody might want to rank for, let's say, sell on TikTok uh, with a blog post or something else. Uh, and as a result of that, they might be ranking for the keyword TikTok as well. And for SEOs, you know, seeing keywords with large search volume is, is cool. And if you're in top position, that's great. You're gonna be getting a lot of traffic. Uh, but the truth is like with keywords such as TikTok, there might be millions of searches per month. Uh, but nobody's gonna click on anything which is not TikTok because they're not interested in learning about TikTok. They just wanna go to TikTok and then start using TikTok. So these keywords don't really play any, have any real value for a business. Uh, and the really valuable ones for e-commerce are the ones that are within the um, transactional sphere. So all of the ones that people use to specifically look for products. So many times, oftentimes there's uh, a modifier like online or cheap or near me, uh, stuff like that next to these keywords. And these are the indicators that these keywords are kind of used to find where they can get a product. So um, if you're developing a website uh, and you're trying to understand which keywords you know, drive traffic to your site, which ones are more valuable, if you see that there's a lot of keywords uh, with modifiers such as uh, online, uh, buy, coupon, order, purchase, cheap, price, stuff like that, you know, these are the keywords that are used primarily by users who are already de determined to make a purchase. Uh, they just need to find where to do it. So these are the ones that you should be prioritizing because uh, as if we think about the marketing funnel, they are at the very bottom of the marketing funnel where the user is already ready to make that purchase. So you just need to kind of give him the opportunity to do so. And the other most valuable set of keywords is the one that's in the commercial investigation because uh, this is, you know, the kind of keywords like I mentioned before, the ones that have modifiers such as best or reviews, uh, things like that, uh, because users who use these uh, are kind of in the decision-making process. Uh, they might be interested in a specific product, but they're not sure which one is the one that they're most interested in. So um, the keyword is not fit uh, for a product page or a specific cat category page unless you're actually comparing different products on uh, that page. But that doesn't mean that you cannot build content that fits these keywords on your site uh, to generate extra traffic that's coming not just from you know your product and your category pages. Uh, but to do that, you need to kind of make sure that you fit the content type and that's more generally like some kind of comparison. Uh, of products and services. So this is, you know, about the search intent types. Understanding what what the correct type is is all about looking at Google. And uh, one thing is looking at patterns. So trying to spot which, like, what type of pages uh, appear most often in top results. But in addition to that, you can also look at just what Google is offering because. Uh, this is where like it's it's a bit of a dilemma for SEOs. Like uh, ultimately, we try to be in you know all of those Google promoted featured snippets they're called, uh, and kind of have our content promoted there. But at the same time, that can kind of backfire because what Google is ultimately doing is they're trying to answer users' questions without having them directed away from Google. So that you know. Uh, and you know, having your website appear on a featured snippet where it answers a question in Google is great. It's like a little small advertisement, but if you've answered the question right spot on, they're gonna, not going to come to your site because they got what they wanted right there in Google. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a challenge, but it's definitely worth paying attention to simply because getting it right can help you get traffic. Getting it wrong will just mean you've spent time and effort uh, without the desired result. Excellent, thank you for that in-depth explanation. If we have time at the end, we might get back to you for some beginner SEO resources, but otherwise we'll have all of uh, Martin's favorite resources linked in the comments on YouTube. Yeah. 
We're going to head back to Nico for a second. Um, we had a question, what if your ideal audience isn't on TikTok? And what if they're shrinking away from social media in general? How can you still reach them? So, okay, so if your ideal audience isn't on TikTok, um, you can still use TikTok to generate interest in other people, right? So even if your ideal audience isn't on TikTok, you can still use TikTok to build brand awareness to uh, basically promote your brand and deliver your brand experience to somebody that could potentially become your ideal audience. Excellent. And maybe Lucas or Sandy, have you seen this sort of trend of people shrinking away from social media in general? And do you have any tips on how to keep them engaged or maybe other ways to engage them outside of social media? Well, I think I think the the, the let's let's call it the problem has has two aspects to it. The first one is uh, you you were just mentioning how to get to the people that I want to get to uh, if they are not on TikTok. If they are not on TikTok and your brand is on TikTok, maybe they are not the people you want to reach out to. Uh, first of all, if if you decided that TikTok was the right platform for your business, then there is two options: or your desired audience and your actual community, so the people that want to hear from you, are on TikTok. If they are not you might have chosen the wrong platform um, because you, you shouldn't, I think, go towards where you want to communicate and to whom you want to communicate, but maybe thinking, where do the people want to hear from me and, and who, like, what platform do they use? Uh, so, so thinking of, about it the other way, just think about what they want instead of thinking what you want. And that goes the same for SEO, for the search intent that Martin was talking about. Um, we, we can't direct people. We can't tell them where to go and, or what to do. We, we just have to go where they are and, and tell them what they want to hear. So, so I think that's a big one. Uh, and, and Nico was mentioning also that the videos on, on TikTok, you can reuse them everywhere. So if those people are not on TikTok, you can always use TikTok to, for the awareness and reuse that video on Instagram if they are more present on Instagram, for example. Uh, like that, you only create one content and reach them on two different platforms. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that there is two, uh, two aspects to it. There is the aspect of maybe it's the wrong platform for you and maybe, or maybe it's the wrong audience. Maybe you haven't really found who is interested in your product yet. Uh, and that means you just need to try to understand better your community. The second is reuse the content and get, get to talk to them where they are and where they actually interact. And that's where like understanding your audience, I think, becomes more important as well. So like understanding what time of day, what day of the week that your community is engaging with social and then on what platforms are doing that. So more and more what I've been like modeling for my community is I sign off on most weekends and then I, I'm hearing from people like, oh, OK, I don't have to be on social media every day. I can also set a limit. So I think that's more the norm that we're seeing. I think it would be very unlikely to see the masses like cut out social altogether. So that's why it becomes really important to see, okay, the bulk of my folks are really active on Thursday nights. So maybe that's the day that I'm gonna start doing like a weekly tip or a weekly something, you know? Um, I, it just, you have to kind of look to see the, you know, in-app stats of, of what's possible. Yeah, I, I don't see put people moving away from social media, at least masses yet. Uh, I think it becomes kind of the, the normal of everyday life for everyone. You might move away from one platform, but I don't think it would be moving away. It would basically be make, migrating to another one. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if today I stop using Instagram, I might go to TikTok. If today I stop using Facebook, I might use LinkedIn. It's just there is always a balance between different platforms. We've seen it when uh, I think it was Clubhouse that started. Uh, they kind of make a lot of shade, like all the other ones were a bit scared. And, and today, those people that went on Clubhouse, they already migrated to a different platform, to Twitter. So, so it's always moving around. And that's where, as Sandy said, you need to understand uh, when and, and where your community is. Absolutely. So Lucas, you had mentioned sort of telling people what they wanted to hear. And Sandy, we got a question for you. What if you lose followers by talking about your interests? I actually think that that's not a bad thing. So I think as as a social media creator, you know, especially starting out, I got caught up in the numbers. Um, 
and my community relative to like my peers in this space is very small. And I realize that that's okay because what's more important is your engagement with that community. So you're more likely to have a more successful business with fewer, num fewer members in your community if they're more highly engaged. So the numbers don't matter so much as the relationship that you're building. So for example, every time I talk about anti-racism or <laughs> supporting queer persons, my followers just go, ooh, and I, you know, that's okay because what we're doing is we're tightening up that community. We're tightening up the interests that our, you know, our community shares, and that's just going to lead to a higher engagement, which then will lead to, you know, better sales and networking down the line. Yeah, I, I, if I can, if I can bounce on that again, um, the the as, as Sandy said, there is probably topic that even if they're they really matter to you, uh, like for example, Sandy say when you talk about racism, it drops. Um, there is two points. First off, maybe you don't you're not interested in then having these people around because at the end of the day, if they're not interested in what you say and like there is no in common interest, then they're actually not part of your community even. So they have nothing to do there. Uh, second, there is a way also a way for your brand to learn from that. And maybe it's not the topic you're talking about, but maybe it's the way you talk about it. Maybe it's the approach you have. Uh, so there is a lot of like ways to learn about what works, uh, what doesn't. And but but I agree with Sandy. Like your follower count decreasing is not a big issue. Uh, obviously, if tomorrow you lose fifty percent of your audience, that that might be a little issue. Um, but but. But again, uh, I think I think you can uh, literally just take it from life uh, as as it is without even thinking e-commerce, without thinking brand. When you have your group of friends and you start doing your thing, the thing you like to do in your life, and you see that you have two of your friends in this group that are moving away from you, it's not a bad thing. It's just that they were not following your interest and following what you wanted to do. Uh, so so you still have eight, and those eight will will probably spend more time with you. Then so same with goes with your customers. Uh, maybe you will lose five out of ten customers, but the five that say they might spend twice as much and compensate for that loss. So, so I don't think it's a really bad thing. It's more an understanding. It also happens every day, like every platform. If you look at your stats over time, I lose followers every day. I gain followers every day. So, I just try. I try not to look at that part of my stats if things are going well because, like. It's the engagement that matters so much more. Definitely. OK, final question um, for everybody. And let's start off with Nico. We have a lot of new or, let's say, people who have just started with Printful or who are starting up an e-commerce business. What's the one main tip that you would give them that they could maybe start with tomorrow? The one main tip that I would give them I mean, really the one main tip I would give them is if they're just starting, you know, to enjoy the journey because it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be, uh, you know, with a lot of learning curves. And, um, you, you know, you might not be able to make your first million dollars within 30 days. If you do, that's awesome. But again, it, I think the, the most important thing is to always be learning, implementing new things and uh, in, implementing it and in, in applying it to your business strategy. Awesome. Sandy, what tip would you give? My tip would be to um, to experiment, especially if you're using um, Printful to create your designs, to create your merchandise. It's totally fine to experiment with designs and to experiment with products when you're starting out, because that's how you're going to learn what your community is responding to. So, you know, for example, one of my first designs, you don't see it on my storefront anymore because as I rolled out smarter and designed and learned from what I created, that one was not as successful. So that's really the best way to learn is just to jump in and experiment. Awesome. Martin? Yeah, so 
I would probably say that my, my one tip would be not to give up and, and you know, keep at it and, and stay persistent because uh, just like with SEO, which is a long-term game by definition, uh, when you're starting off, things will be slow, uh, which means that, you know, you just need to keep doing it, keep trying, keep looking for things that work. And, you know, if you're determined enough, eventually it's going to work out. But, uh, you know, oftentimes it doesn't work out because uh, you kind of drop off a bit too soon. So my advice would be not to. And Lucas, any words of wisdom on your side? Well, I mean, to, 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 to summarize, I think, and, and that's what, I, what I've been talking about since, since we started, I think, focus on the people. Uh, you might have the best product in the world, you might not. Uh, at the end of the day, without your clients and without your community, you have the best product, but you, like, you're just not selling it. Um, so, so as a starting business, as a starting brand, e-commerce, or whatever you do, any projects that you start, identify who is your community, identify even inside that community, Maybe the team of the top members of that community, the top 10 are the people that actually engage, can be even your family, your friends, and use them. Just leverage their, their power. They, they will maybe not buy from you, but they will recommend you. They will engage with your brand. They will share what you say. Uh, I, I always make fun of, you know, like when you, when you share something on your personal uh, network and you have your mom sharing, you know, the, your post on, on Facebook or things like this. Like this, this is this is great marketing. This is someone sharing organically your content and, and sharing to their own community. So yeah, fo focus on the people, uh, focus on the top members, and and again, yeah, it's it's gonna be slow. Uh, Ninety nine percent of people don't make their uh, first million in in thirty days. Uh, that doesn't happen that much, uh, but it will happen uh, if you do things uh, like you should, and and it's just gonna take some time and and some conversation with your community. Absolutely. Always use the support of your mom. Great. <laughs> Great tip as well. Exactly. Good, 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 good summary of it. <laughs> yes. Okay, that was the final question of the day. So thank you so much, dear speakers, for being here. It was a pleasure to savor the fruits of your labor and to learn from you guys. And thank you to our audience members as well for your comments and questions and for participating so actively. It's always a joy to hear from you. We hope that our speakers gave you some words of inspiration and encouragement that you can take with you for your own business and your life. And it's not too late to post your findings on social media using the hashtag Printful Threads. I promise, it's the last time I'll say it. Don't forget, within the next 24 hours, we'll be picking three lucky winners to win a $30 coupon. If you're a winner, you'll get a DM from us on whatever social media platform you used. And as a thank you to everyone watching, you can browse the Printful catalog play with our free design maker, and order some cool custom goodies with, for yourself using the coupon code THREADSVOL4. There it is on the screen. All you have to do is enter the code at checkout and you'll get $5 off your order. The coupon expires at the end of August 9th, so you still have a little time to figure out what design you want to get. Be sure to check out the terms and conditions in the YouTube description box. For more marketing tips, you're welcome to check out the Printful website, blog, or YouTube channel. I also highly recommend checking out our brand new Printful Academy courses. We have one that's for beginners, and we also have another one that's dedicated purely to product marketing with some more organic and paid marketing tips. If you finish the courses, you'll also get points which you can exchange for goodies. Same as last time, let's keep this goodbye short and sweet. Thank you so much for joining, and I'll see you next time. Printful's Design Maker is your ultimate free tool for making product designs and mockups. Pick a premium product and design directly on it. Upload your own graphics or start from scratch with clip art for every occasion and hundreds of unique fonts. Make patterns for all of our print products and add vibrant background colors and graphics. Create embroidered designs and instantly see what the finished product will look like. Bring your ideas to life in minutes with Printful's Design Maker.